July 12th, 1990. Dear diary, George was suspended from school today again. Story time was just not the same without George. I missed the excitement in his eyes when I turned the storybook around to show the pictures on the page. George always leans in close, as though attempting to insert himself into the storyline. Mm. The last thing George needs is more missed instructional time. I sure hope they will allow him to return real soon. One of my most salient memories of that first TFA Institute was my encounter with a kid named George. George was a second grader in the class where I performed my student teaching. He is also the kid featured on that early TFA poster where I posed the question, how can we afford not to make this work? George had the most winsome smile. He liked chocolate chip cookies. He had a quick wit about him, and George loved story time. Ironically, George couldn't read the stories that he loved to hear. Something seemed woefully amiss with that scenario. George, like too many of his classmates, was already performing below grade level in both reading and math. Yet George's academic in, academic in no way a reflection of his intellectual capacity. Rather, it was in every way a symptom of inequity in public education. The question that I posed in 1990 was intended to keep our focus on George and all the boys and girls who, like George, were being denied the opportunity to reach their full potential because of the zip codes and color codes and income codes that assigned them to inadequate schools. At the end of our eight weeks of training, I remember feeling as though the pressures and uncertainties that surfaced during our first institute had taken their toll on our collective spirit. Frankly, I worried that the momentary hardships we faced might overshadow the lasting change we sought. As the person chosen to give that commencement address, I felt it essential to speak to the enduring tie that bound us together. That tie, I determined, was a deep, abiding hope. Despite our differences and our internal conflicts, we all embodied the hope that we actually could create a world where every child had access to an excellent education one day. So I've come to the nation's capital this weekend to draw from the well of hope, a hope whose thirst cannot be quenched until we reach that vision of one day. We may not get there next year. We may not get there in five years, but I still have hope that we will get there one day. I still have hope that we will close the achievement gap one day. I still have hope that we will overcome educational inequity one day. 
I still have hope that an education in the hoods of our inner cities can measure up to an education in the hills of our suburbs one day. I still have hope that every child will have access to an excellent education one day. October 22nd, 1990. We just finished our unit on Homer and the Odyssey, which I created with help from Sandy, who's also teaching fifth grade. I was amazed at how an epic poem had grabbed my kids' attention, given how tough the material was. For their final assignment, I asked my class to write a report on the Greek poet. They were so excited to hand in their assignments today. Even Trevor, who's been struggling in class and dealing with a lot at home. I couldn't wait to see the report. I started flipping through them right after I got home when something bright yellow caught my eye. I pulled out Trevor's report and saw a perfect rendition of Homer Simpson. Trevor had written a 10-page report on the life and times of Homer Simpson <laughs> with illustrations that he had done himself and meticulous details from the TV show that captured perfectly America's beloved cartoon dad. It was a great report, but it wasn't the Homer I was looking for. And Trevor, Trevor wasn't the only one. A few of my other kids had also written on the wrong Homer. I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Obviously, i um, devastated. I clearly missed the mark. The lives of my kids are so far from what I'm trying to teach them. And I have so far to go as a teacher. But you know, I'm really hopeful too. It was so obvious from my kids' report how incredibly talented and creative they are. It's going to be up to me to find a way to bridge the gap and to tap into their full potential. I'll write more later when hopefully I'll have more perspective. I have to go now. I have to go get, I got to get some beer for the potluck I'm hosting tonight for core members. Um, it's been 25 years since I took my first job teaching fifth graders at PS 307 in Brooklyn, New York. Since then, I've held, I've held roles in both the private sector and the public sector. I've worked with district schools and charter schools. But what stayed with me all these years later is what I started learning that day in October when I reviewed Trevor's report. That this is all about the incredible potential of our students. And it's our responsibility to ensure that they live into it. I've seen what can go wrong when we lose sight of it. But I've seen spectacular things happen when we fundamentally believe in the promise of our students and we do everything we can to unleash it. I feel so incredibly fortunate to be part of a community doing just that. When we were just 483 core members back in 1990, I could not have envisioned the size and the diversity of this room today. 25 years later, our work is far from done. But I'm so excited to build upon all the progress that's been made working alongside all of you, especially our new generation of core members. As I look, as I look around the room, I've never felt more optimistic about the future we'll build together. February 23rd, 1991. 
Today, I had an aha moment. This morning, there was a letter to the editor of the Times-Picayune about my school, Booker T. Washington, here in New Orleans, Louisiana. At first, I thought, this looks interesting. But then I couldn't believe my eyes. The author actually argued that my school should be shut, saying that my students only came to school to make babies and drug deals. That certainly does not describe Kendra or Tori or any of my students. <laughs> They're so keen to learn that they sometimes cut the class of that long-term sub down the hall to spend double time with the incredible Miss Green. That letter was such a powerful reminder that my students aren't up against only lousy academics. They're up against a society that does not believe they can succeed. That line of thinking could keep my students from ever having any real power in our country. <laughs> 15 years ago, I was elected to the school board here in Washington, D.C. It was clear that the same low expectations were alive and well. And some days, I wondered, would that ever change? But I was fortunate to have the guidance of another school board mentor, the venerable civil rights leader and Pulitzer Prize winner, Roger Wilkins. At age 68, Roger had accomplished a lot. Yet he had stepped up to become a member of this board. He gave me his reason. He said, Julie, our schools are failing our kids. I felt the need to do something about that. And so here I am. Here I am. Here we are. For the past 25 years, we have been fighting to prove that the low expectations and deeply seated prejudices that limit the life opportunities of the students we teach are fundamentally wrong. We have never lost sight of that vision. And yet, it's about something so much bigger than making sure our students are college ready. We will be successful when the students that we've taught are the leaders in our classrooms, in the boardrooms, in our cities and of our country. That will be the mark of our success. So here we are. Let's do this. Given the energy in this room that's palpable, I know that we are up for this challenge. Thank you.